So welcome everyone to the 18th uh, Drugstore Culture podcast, and this is about Brexit. As you know, we try and ration our Brexit coverage, um, because too much of a bad thing can be very bad for you. And uh, this is, however, a week where we really can't ignore it. Uh, Theresa May has just survived a vote of no confidence in the Commons by a margin of 19. And so though her deal has been comprehensively rejected and the biggest um, defeat for a government in modern history, she lives to fight another day. Um, and it's dominating the headlines, but I think still confusing the hell out of everyone. Um, Olive, what do you make of it all? Um, I mean, it's just really frustrating. It just feels like a complete waste of time. I mean, if not just today, but just the whole Brexit process from the very first referendum, it just feels like we've wasted two and a half years. There's loads of other things that we could be solving. People are homeless, people are hungry, and they're fannying about in Parliament arguing about who's going to be in charge. But everyone who could be in charge just wants to be have power. They don't really want to help. That's what it feels like from my perspective anyway. Um, yeah. And yeah, it just feels like, I know it's important, but I'm sick of it. <laughs> Has it changed your opinion of Corbyn in the last few days at all? Yeah, I mean, I've not felt good about Corbyn for a while, but I know, like a lot of my friends, for instance, who like were Corbyn supporters, now feel like he's not the right person. To because be of Brexit, or yeah, I think because of Brexit. I mean, obviously there's that anti-Semitism thing that's mm-hmm. kind of tarnished his name over the past few months. But I think the whole not wanting to call a people's vote and kind of not really having a plan. And um, so if, so he called this vote of no confidence, but then if he came into power, we're like, what was he planning to do? Was, was he just gonna magic a good Brexit? And <laughs> it just feels like- That is precisely what he's saying though, isn't it? That he, there should be an election so he can sit at number 10 and he will deliver this magical Brexit deal. Yeah, but it's crazy. And then what, we'll just waste more time having a general election, not really solving anything, just passing it's like everyone's throwing around this hot potato that no one wants to hold because mm. it's just a mess that no one can actually really fix pete everyone expected it to win and so i guess there's a sense of anticlimax to win the no confidence to win the no, the, yeah. to, to win the no confidence vote uh she's won by a margin of 19 which is more than her working majority so yeah. although it's not a big margin it's safe for now yeah um but she's in a really bad way isn't she i mean it one gets the sense that this is by no means the end of her survival story. Um, I think... I mean, she's been in a bad way for, what, two years now? Yes. Uh, she didn't win a majority. She's had a couple of years of um, trying to deliver Brexit. I mean, Brexit is the only thing. and Defines her premiership. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, it's Olive's point that so much has been ignored. When, when you say, often with a government, you can sort of define them in some way. And you can think these were the things they did, you know. If, even with Cameron, you know, the Cameron government, you can think, okay, there was austerity. Um, there's possibly even Brexit to some yes. extent, you know, starting that process. But there's things you can rattle off, like welfare. They did a fair bit on education. You know, there are lists. Yes. Um, with Theresa May, it's Brexit, Brexit, Brexit. I mean, she made the famously and, she made the burning injustices speech, which I think a lot of yeah. us thought was quite inspiring in Downing Street uh, and absolutely has failed to deliver on any of that. But that's the thing, not not only has the wider policy agenda just not happened, um, I mean, okay, if if you're a nerd you can sort of identify little things here and there. Pretty little though. But but in terms of the overall picture, um, there's nothing but Brexit. This is the one thing that she said, guys, I got it, I got Brexit. And all we've had for two years is a load of distraction. You know, I, I mean, I mentioned in a post this morning, it's times like this when I think of the Chequers deal. Yeah. You know, the, this, was, this was the big moment where Theresa May sorted out with her cabinet, this is what our Brexit will be like. And some people didn't like it. Boris Johnson resigned. David Davis resigned around that time. Um, some people did like it. And, it's, and we're all writing about it. And it was meaningless, you know, because um, it hadn't been agreed with Europe. And the final result, the final, her final deal... Um, is is not the Chequers deal, and her final deal has also now not got through Parliament. You know, the one thing that we've been bored to death with for two years that has dominated everything, and it's a mess. Was there ever a time, Olive, when you thought, just from what you were seeing, that 
she might pull it off, that there might be a Brexit that wouldn't be disastrous in the last two years? Or have you always felt this no. is going to be a terrible thing? I've, yeah, I've always felt it's going to be a terrible yeah. thing. It, it, but I feel like, in fact, probably... I've always known, I've always not wanted to leave the EU, but as time has gone on, it's kind of become more and more apparent why we definitely should not yeah. leave the mm. EU. Um, yeah, no, I never thought she could pull it off. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, and I think, I think what's interesting is that it's now apparent to me anyway that there is no deal. Um, th there's leaving Brexit, th there's, leaving Bre there's leaving the EU through Brexit, um, possibly with no deal and there's Remain, but any of the, the, the deal ideas, the various configurations of staying in the single market, staying in the customs union, what people call these jargon names, Norway plus, Canada plus, whatever you want to call it, they all have drawbacks. And, you know, I spent the last sort of 24 hours trying to tot up majorities in the House of Commons, and I can't find a single one of them that would command a majority. Yeah. I mean, can you, Pete, you, you, you know, you've, you've got a good knowledge of the the kind of balance of the parties, do you see any way through for a deal? I mean, this isn't a direct answer to your question, but I think what is really striking about all this is um, we've had two years and it's had a polarising effect. Um, so what, people have been pushed more in hard yeah, in that exactly. position rather than... exactly. So together. because so many of the options in the middle are disagreeable to this side or yeah. that side, um, and, and also because no one really is enthusiastic, I mean... We had we had a vote. The vote was problematic in many ways. I know you don't like the word problematic, well, but I, I, uh, yeah, it, it, in, in this context, yeah. Hail Mary so passwords. it was it was it's problematic in very in, in various ways. But it's telling. It, it was a question of do you want to leave? Do you want to stay? And really, they're the two positions positions that have been crystallised in British politics. You know what Theresa May is trying to do is find out the grey area in yes. the middle where people might come together. But people don't want to come together in that territory. I, I'm a Remainer. Yes. I want to remain. I'm sort of, okay, I'd prefer a softer Brexit than a harder Brexit. But no one wakes up and thinks, oh, well, actually, I'd quite like it. You know, what I really, really want is a Brexit that has I, I, a bit I think, of custom tuning. I think it's even worse. Thing. I think that in 2016, I mean, you're not... One of the things that irritates me in all of this is that you're never allowed to criticise the electorate's decision in 2016 mm. that has achieved a kind of sacred status that whatever else you say in political language you have to kind of acknowledge that uh, that decision was taken and has to be respected no I don't respect it because it was a stupid decision made on the basis of lies mm. and one of the lies was that we could leave the EU but keep all the benefits of EU membership which was just nonsense um, and I think people are finally coming around to that so I guess my next question uh, I, the kind of thing that kind of animates me is you know, we, we've we've since we launched online, we've been very strong supporters of the people's vote, mm -hmm. and particularly given space to the youth wing of the, that, that movement, FFS mm -hmm. and OFROC. Um, and I think that's been very much in the spirit of drugstore culture. And people criticise people's vote, saying it would just reopen all these wounds. But my view is, a if if situation changes you're richly entitled to revisit a decision, especially if it was made on false pretenses. And also, you know, there's, there's no reason not to go back and look at something if, if it's quite clear that it's not working. I, I've absolutely no kind of respect for this argument that we have to be very, very, we have to tiptoe around the 2016 referendum when the stakes are that high. Mm -hmm. And do you, I mean, do you think, I mean, how do you feel about our, how, baked into the drugstore culture, culture, as it were, the people's vote is. You know, are you as strong with it as we were at the start? Oh, I'm, I'm stronger now, yeah, me too. I think, with it. Um, I, I think there's a sort of moral obligation, I think, to hold another vote, um, because the first vote was done more or less under false pretenses that seem falser by the day. Um, and it was not... It was not a democratic vote. It was a submer subverted democratic vote, um, and that's troubling, you know. So I think even on that ground, people deserve a say. On the grounds as well that you're right, you, the way things have panned out, no one voted on how it's turned out now, and we've sat by and watched the biggest change to our country for decades. We've sat by and watched as some incompetent politicians have decided how it goes, uh, and even then they can't decide. Um, but I also think now, after 
today and yesterday, it's the only sensible way out of this. I, I can't know. see any other. Exactly. I can't see another route out. I think if I were Theresa May, and, and you can understand why she's opposed because of the nature of her party and her party membership, you can understand her sort of reluctance to go with the people's vote, but if I were her, I'd, I'd be thinking, it's my get out of jail free yes. card to some extent, you know, pass it back to the public. It's, it's the right thing to do, but in a weird way, it's the easy thing to do. I mean, it may become the only way to um, prevent this becoming a kind of ongoing permanent constitutional logjam. Yeah. You do have to pass primary legislation to have a referendum, another referendum, so it is, it is difficult. Um, Olive, uh, you know, just going back to the whole question of especially young people and trust, do you think a second referendum would would be a positive thing? Um, or, would it, or would it polarise people even more and make them more disillusioned? I don't know. I think, I mean, obviously I would love to have a second, a second referendum, but I do, I think even before doing a second referendum, there's already an issue with trust. Like, I, I mean, I feel at the moment it's like, well, who do you support? Who do you vote for? Because there's no one, like, it doesn't feel like anyone cares actually about the issue. They're all just saying what they feel like they need to say to win. And I think that is the issue. And I think kind of, I mean, I don't know, but I feel like Brexit has kind of shown us a larger problem within the political system at the moment that like just doesn't seem to be working. Well, you mentioned to me earlier when we were discussing this that, that, that no one seemed to apologise anymore, which really yeah. struck me because um, last night when Theresa May um, lost the vote on the deal by a colossal 230 vote margin, she barely recognised the, the, the scale of what had happened and moved straight on to accusing the Commons of not having an alternative. And I, 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 I mean, I, I think I've probably become almost inured to it. But I think to people who don't watch politics obsessively, it must just seem crazy, this. Um, this, this kind of totally cloth-eared inability to respect and recognise that something big has happened and that if you know if you're to be the leader of the country as well of a party and a, and a government, you have to recognise that. I just what, yeah. I mean, is that how it came across to you? Or? Yeah. Well, it's just like the whole thing. I just feel like there's been no honesty. No one will speak frankly and honestly, honestly about yeah. the situation because everyone wants to save their skin. So it's like no one will hold their hands up and say, "Oh, actually, maybe we made a wrong decision, or maybe this wasn't the best deal or the best plan." or I didn't really know what we were getting into. No one will say that because they want to stay in power or they want to be able to like potentially return to power. And I think that is kind of the fundamental issue because it just kind of, you feel hopeless. And it's like, that's kind of what got us into this situation in the first place because people felt hopeless. So they wanted to vote for something that they would feel like their voices would be recognized. Like that's what you hear about people who voted leave a lot is that the fact that they wanted to make a statement basically. Um, and I feel like now we feel even more hopeless. Pete, we've got sort of just over 70 days left until March 29th when, you know, other things being equal, the clock will just run out and we would leave without a deal. Mm -hmm. What, you know, not forcing you to, to prediction, but what do you see as the, the likely scenarios for those remaining days? What do you kind of, what, if you have to game it, what do you kind of see as happening? I, I, I resist predictions nowadays. Yeah, um, very wise. I mean, she seems so utterly resistant to resigning, but I, I could also foresee Theresa May resigning. You know? Well, of course, what I can mean, often happen, as in 74, 79, is that you have repeated votes of no confidence. Yeah. I think there were six in the end until Callan finally left and yeah. the Thatcher era began. So I suspect Labour will carry on yeah. doing this. It's so hard to predict, though, because you're right. Theresa May's response last night was not the response of a normal person, let alone a normal no. politician. Um, and you can get very, very, very far, we've discovered, and Trump's another example of this. The unembarrassable. Yeah, if you don't have shame. Yeah. Um, and I think what all of this has shown, what the past few years have shown, is that our politics depended on sort of unwritten codes. There was, mm. yeah, I wouldn't have said this at the time, but there were obviously standards of decency mm. within politics. and cynical about politicians as other people are but I'm way more cynical about them now because those standards of decency don't apply um, Theresa May can just sort of 
carry on. She she can just ignore things, you know. There's no sense of falling on one sword or being sorry. And, and we see this everywhere. We see this with politicians that have been in and out of cabinet. We see it over in America, obviously. Um, but this, I mean, that's just one factor that creates this totally unpredictable mess. Um, because if you've been following politics for for years, as as we have, I I feel that the measures and the metrics that we've applied for so long don't apply anymore. I mean, I, I think the only thing in all of this that gives me any sort of grounds for optimism is is the youth movements. I mean, we've talked a lot at Drugstore Culture about being focused upon rock grassroots activism mm. rather than uh, Westminster, and I think that's been a good decision because actually, if you look at people's vote, it started out as almost the liberal elite asking for its job back, basically. Mm. And it, but it's it's transmuted into this kind of remarkably strong youth movement with people like um, Femi and Will Dry, you know, Lara Spirit and so on. And they've been the sort of spokespeople of the movement. And that, I think, has changed it completely from being a kind of backward-looking movement into the sort of movement of younger people um, demanding that they have a say in their future. Um, does that... Um, do you both have a kind of bit of optimism from that? Olive, bit of... Yeah, Bit of hope? I mean, scraps of hope. I don't know because I mean I don't really understand the technicalities of how it all works, but it's just I don't know how that will translate into actually Westminster, like unless Jeremy Corbyn sucks it up and calls the people's vote, then I don't like. Yeah, I don't know what they can do, but that's probably just because I don't know. Well, I mean, no, you're you're right, I and mean, even. The, you're quite right. It's even if all of Labour um, votes on block for a people's vote, that doesn't get you there. Mm. So there have to be a substantial number of Tories who, who remainers who are willing to do that. So, but I think go back to something you said, Pete. You know, there might come a time when it is literally the only option available to her. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess myself, I have a sort of limited optimism. Um, I think. I think one of the great things about nowadays is that you can start a political movement from your bedroom. Um, and, and I mean, that's not what we've literally seen with people's vote, but you know, with not far so, off. Not far off with social media, with enthusiasm, you can get out there and you can actually change things. Um, but as Olive says, there's this stopping point, which is Westminster itself. Um, okay, maybe you can change the minds of MPs, but fundamentally, we've seen. A Westminster that's cut off and has been doing its own thing for two years, um, and if if you can't break into that, what can you do? And and this is something we've seen everywhere. There, there are all these sort of enthusiastic, modern, heartening, modern trends. France, for example, you know, Macron was another person who basically started a political party from yeah. his bedroom, um, and look where it's ended up. Um, you know, I I think he sort of getting a hard deal at the moment but but still there are riots on the streets as, as soon as he becomes yes because you can a politician the problem, the problem of course is that everyone can yeah, yeah anyone can be a politician now and it, it, Trump the Julia Jones anyone it always feels like the tide breaks at Washington or in Paris or London you know it can swell and swell and swell and then it just hits a wall yeah um, and I think that that's my cause for pessimism amid all this well We've got just over 70 days. We will keep drugstore cultures, readers and viewers up to date. We won't overwhelm you with it because we know you have much more interesting things to do and watch. But thank you both and thank you for watching. <laughs>